the homily for the third Sunday after Epiphany. My dear friends, today we read in the Gospel the beautiful story of two miracles, two healings which our Lord Jesus Christ performs. Now, in both instances, there is something that stands out, and that is the great faith of those who were requesting the miracles. If you look at these men, both of them come to our Lord, asking Him to do something extraordinary. They come and ask Him to exercise divine power, to work miracles in their behalf, and neither of them hesitating. Imagine for a moment that you come to someone and you say, can you make a miracle for me? And not asking like a question, not like, could you make a miracle, but you're saying, you can, so would you, can you make this miracle for me, please? That would mean that you have absolute faith in this person, and that is exactly how these men approached our Lord. Now, not only that, but their faith in our Lord was complete. And you must consider that this was before our Lord's triumph. They already believed that our Lord Jesus Christ was God. Because there were many that believed that our Lord Jesus Christ was a prophet, or that he was a saint, or that he was a very good man that could obtain from God, uh, you know, many good things. But not many believe that Christ was God. However, these men, we see that they believe that. They make it very clear that they know that our Lord Jesus Christ can perform these miracles of his own will. It's not just that he's asking God. It is that he's doing them. That he has the power of God himself. And so they say, if you want, you can heal me. They believe then that our Lord Jesus Christ was God. Their faith was entire. My friends, this distinction between men that believe partly in our Lord Jesus Christ and believe fully in Him, we can see it even today. How many people are there around you that you could ask them and they would not know or they would not believe that our Lord Jesus Christ is truly God. But along this truth of the faith, there are many others that are also ignored, and this sometimes even by Catholics. My friends, for this reason, I thought it would be a good idea today to speak about the different ways in which one could sin against the faith. Faith is the greatest treasure that we have. Today I want to speak to you about how it can be lost so that we take preventive measures and we never lose our faith. So we're going to talk about several different sins. First, the sin of omission, of ignorance of the faith. Then we will speak of doubt against the faith. Then of heresy. And finally, of apostasy. The first one that we are covering then is omission or ignorance of the faith. To put it as simple as I can, if you are aware that the Catholic faith is the true faith and you neglect to inform yourself of the truths that are necessary for your salvation, of the main truths of the faith, again I say you neglect to know them, then you are obviously committing a serious sin. Because if you know the truth and if you know that it's important and you neglect to know it, that can only be a serious sin, of course. Again, I emphasize that this must, this must be out of negligence, out of carelessness. So, my friends, if you are a priest, if you are a parent, if you are the owner of a company with employees, you have the obligation of making sure that those under your care know the faith. And you would be committing a mortal sin. You would be going to hell if you are careless about it. Now, as of course, when we know this, when we hear this, our first question must be, okay, then what are the truths that they ought to know? And I'll give you five. First, they must know the main dogmas of the faith. Obviously, that's contained in the Apostles' Creed. Now, here I don't mean just that they must memorize the Apostles' Creed. What I mean is they must understand each one of the articles. Second, they must know what they ought to practice. Obviously, that is the Ten Commandments, the commandments of the Church, the duties of state. Third, we must know what can we ask of God? What are we to expect from God? 
and that is contained in the Our Father. Again, we're talking about understanding the petitions of the Our Father. Fourth, we have to know what we can receive from God. What are the things that God gave us, that God put on this earth for us? And that obviously means the sacraments. We must know the sacraments, how to receive them, what they are. And fifth, we need to know what can we expect in the afterlife. That there is heaven, that there is hell, that there is purgatory. That there is judgment and there is death. That is the four last things. So again, five things that we ought to know. The main dogmas of the faith, what you ought to practice, what we may ask of God, what we can receive from God, and what we can expect in the afterlife. That is to say, the Apostles' Creed, the Ten Commandments, the commandments of the Church, the Our Father, the sacraments, the four last things. So, if you are a father or a mother, and your son would not be able to explain what the creed means, at least broadly, or if your son doesn't know the commandments or what they mean, or he doesn't know the sacraments and what they are, or if your son or your child or your daughter doesn't know that there is a hell and that there is a heaven, and if this ignorance in your child is the cause of your own fault, is, is caused through your own fault, through your own negligence and forgetfulness, then you will be committing a mortal sin, at least until you start taking the due diligence to solve the problem. That would be the sin by omission. The other way in which we could sin against the faith, God forbid, would be by doubting any dogma of the church, just by doubt. Now this point requires some explanation. The church is not afraid of putting its doctrines to the test, to the test of reason or scrutiny, because the church is absolutely certain of being in the possession of the truth, and so any challenge or question made against some article of the faith will not be met with fear by the church. The church will never desire to hide. The church knows that it has the truth. And that's why from the very first times, the doctors and theologians have scrutinized and examined each and every doctrine of the church without fear. Then why are we forbidden to doubt? Precisely because of that certainty. Because we're certain of the truth, it would be mortally sinful for us to even doubt one dogma of the faith. We are certain of the truth of our faith because we know that God has revealed it. And so when I doubt one dogma of the faith, I doubt God himself. It is like saying God is not truthful. It is like saying God could be deceived. And because there can be no partial negation of the faith, you either believe it or you don't. If you doubt, it's denying, it's basically denying, even if it's just one single article. You are denying and doubting the whole foundation of the faith, which is the authority of God himself. And that's why doubt is also a sin. Now, you might be surprised, but many young people don't know this. Many young people think that by doubting the faith, they, no, they do not sin. But no, it is a sin to doubt the faith. That's why we must never allow even the thought to come. My dear friends, we must have a strong faith. And today, I want to give you an example of this. During the French Revolution, as you well know, mass was forbidden. Priests were forbidden to... To, uh, to exercise their ministry. But there were many faithful, pious people that still held on to the faith, to the sacraments, to all the things that we mentioned. Imagine, I'd like to tell you, ask yourself, would I go to Mass if I knew that I would be killed for going? Would I bring a priest into my house if I knew that I would be killed for doing so? Right now, in reality, like if it was happening right now, would you do it? I think that most of us could doubt. But in France, and I'm, I'm hoping that in your case as well, people were strong in the faith. And there were many people that hid priests in their houses, even risking danger of death to have the Mass and the sacraments. There was one particular case that was recorded of a priest that was captured and the priest was asked, 
What were you doing in there? And he said I was having sac- I was having the sacrifice of the mass. And they said, are you willing? How can you say that when you know that that will cause you to die? Do you still abide by, by that statement? And, and he said, yes. And I'm willing to die for it. And so they accused him of fanatism. They accused him of deceiving the people. And they tortured him to get the names of those people that were in mass. But the priest would not say them. However, the ladies that had brought the priest... Ten pious and faithful ladies came forth, and they said it, and they were imprisoned with him. The priest was condemned to the guillotine. He was brought out, and all the women were made to watch him die. And the priest, as he was about to die, he was singing. And he went to the guillotine dressed for mass. He was dressed with all his ornaments. That, by the very idea of the same people that condemned him. They wanted him to die with the instruments of his fanatism, they said. And then they took them out from him and they burned them in front of his eyes and then they cut his head. And that, my dear friends, was a glorious death because that priest reached heaven. We may believe that those women also who had witnessed his death and were also punished are also in the glory now, happy that they made those decisions, happy that they kept their faith. Now, my friends, let's look at the other two sins that might be committed against the faith. The next one would be heresy. Now, when we hear the word of heresy or heretic, we usually think of a religious hardliner that is accusing someone else of not being fully orthodox. And we think that's kind of a... uh, an extremist thing to say, you know, to call someone a heretic or heresy. We should not be deceived, though. Heresy, or heretic, is a term that is used for one who is baptized. That means to say that at one point he belonged to the Catholic Church, but denies voluntarily and pertinaciously any dogma of the Catholic faith. It is a big deal. Now, notice here the words voluntarily and pertinaciously. For one to be a heretic, the sin has to be voluntary. That is, You're not a heretic if you're in error about something that the Catholic Church teaches. You're in heresy if you know that the Catholic Church teaches otherwise and you willingly deny that doctrine. But if you don't know what the Catholic Church teaches in that regards, then you're not a heretic. You're just a person in error. And you would probably correct when you are told. However, if you would not correct when you're told, then you are pertinacious about this error and you're voluntarily in this error and then you would be properly called a heretic now my dear friends we tend to see these things as if they were not important we tend to think for example that impurity or killing or something like that are worse sins than anything else but actually heresy is one of the worst things that you can imagine it is one of the most dangerous sins that there could be and one that ought to be combated with all our heart, with all our strength. Why is that? Because all the other forms in which you could lose your faith are quite evidently against God. They are quite notoriously evil. They are obviously a rejection of religion. It is easy to spot them, to reject them, and to fear them. You could say that all the other sins against the faith are poison in a bottle, But they are labeled poison. They are bright red. There is a big sign in there that says this is bad, this is wrong. Because all the other sins against the faith are quite notoriously evil. Heresy, on the other hand, is a sin that keeps some appearance of piety. Some appearance of godliness. Don't be mistaken. It destroys the faith. It destroys the life of grace. It separates you from God. It separates you from the church. It sends you to hell, but it still keeps some appearance of piety, some appearance of goodness. It is, as if you you will, poison in a bottle that is labeled as medicine. And it is because of that deceitful nature that this sin is a lot more dangerous. It is a lot more pernicious. It is a lot more contagious. And that's why heresy is one of the things that we must dread the most and that we must fight with more strength than anything else. 
From this sin comes the next and the last one, which would be apostasy. Apostasy, which is the total abandonment of the faith professed in baptism. Apostasy and heresy are in the same line. They are, you could say, the same sort of sin. The only difference is the degree of them. One is partial, the other one is total. Heresy is a rejection of one truth. Apostasy is the rejection of all truths. So apostasy, you could say, is total and universal heresy. It is the denial of all the truths of the faith. But my friends, here there is an, a thing that is important to mention. That doesn't have to be done explicitly. To be an apostate, you don't have to go and deny each one of all the dogmas of the faith. Neither is it necessary that to be an apostate, you join another religion, that you become Hinduist or Buddhist, or that you join communism. To be an apostate, it suffices that you adopt a philosophy, a way of thinking, which is contrary to the Catholic faith. And don't take my words for it. Here is what the theologian Royo Marin said, and this is a modern theologian. This is from the 1960s. He says, quote, They are true apostates who, after receiving baptism, have entirely abandoned the Catholic faith, falling into incredulity, atheism, free thinking, rationalism, pantheism, religious indifferentism, or any other error incompatible with the Catholic faith, even if they haven't entered any false religion. End of quote. My friends, take note of this quote, because he says, They are true apostates who embrace religious indifferentism. Religious indifferentism, I'm sure you know, is the idea that every religion is good to be saved, that we can go to heaven with any other religion, that you can be a Hinduist, a Buddhist, a, a Lutheran, a Calvinist, and make it to heaven. Basically, all roads lead to God. This is precisely what you see promoted in the New Vatican Church. This is the spirit of Vatican II. The idea that any religion will take you to heaven. Religious indifferentism is what Francis preaches. It is what John Paul II preached. It is what Benedict XVI preached. They embrace many other things that seem Catholic, but at the same time they embrace religious indifferentism. And here you have a theologian from the 1960s, a modern one, telling you this is not simple heresy. It is not just an error. It is apostasy from the faith. My dear friends, we must avoid with all our strength these errors and those who preach them. And rather make a serious effort to practice and keep our Catholic faith with all our hearts. I've told you many things in this sermon. I've told you the errors that you can commit against the faith, the sins by which you could lose your faith, the sin of omission, the sin of voluntary ignorance, which is the same, the sin of doubting the faith, the sin of heresy, the sin of apostasy. But I want to leave you with one idea, at least keep this one. You want to know how concerned you should be about keeping your faith. Let me put it this way to you. Your faith is your eyes for eternity. Your eyes. I ask you, how careful are you with your eyes? If you have a disease, an injury, if you have some splinter or something in your eyes, do you just let it go and say, oh, we'll wait until it gets better? Do you wait? one day or two, without doing anything about it? Or do you correct it immediately? Well, in the same manner, that with your eyes of the body, you will not allow anything to be in there, any problem, any disease to be there without immediately trying to correct it. With the eyes of your soul, which is your faith, you should not allow any defect to remain incorrected. Let me give you another analogy. Let's say that there is a room and there is a sign outside of the room saying you might, lose, you might lose your eyes if you come in here. Or let's say that you're going to talk to a person and they tell you, well, you might lose your eyes if you talk to this person. Or there is some activity and they tell you, well, you can do this activity, it's very fun, it's very nice. Some people have lost their eyes though. 
would you do it? Of course not. If you were to enter a room and you saw in there a sign that says a lot of people that come in here lose their eyesight, you would not walk in there, you would immediately step out. In the same manner, you should never do, you should never hear, you should never talk to anyone, you should never enter anywhere or watch anything where your faith might be lost because your faith is the eyes of your soul. If you lose your faith, you're blind, entirely blind for eternity. And so, my dear friends, as we continue Mass today, let us exercise our faith while assisting to the Holy Sacrifice. Exercise your faith by looking at the tabernacle, believing that Jesus Christ is truly present there. Exercise your faith by offering the sacrifice with the priest and saying to yourself, Here I am in the true church established by the true God, and I'm offering the holy sacrifice of the Mass, which is the sacrifice of the cross itself to the Most Holy Trinity. Exercise your faith by telling God today, God here in the tabernacle with us, telling Him from your heart, I believe, and I will believe until I die. I believe everything that the Catholic Church teaches. I make no exception whatsoever. If the Catholic Church says that it is true, then I say it is true, whether if I understand it or not, I believe it. And I am willing to die for it. Not only do I believe it, I am willing to die for it, to die rather than deny just one truth of the Church. When you say the Apostles' Creed in today's Mass, say it with passion, say it from your heart, say it believing and willing to give your, di your, your, your life for each and every single art article that you say. Say it with passion and with love. Say it with faith. Credo in unum Deum. Credo in unum Sanctam, Catholicam, et Apostolicam, Ecclesiam. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs>